in the field today and I'm going to tell you a story. But before I even get to that, there's something I want to cover. You saw that cardboard box? Well, here's one even better, a phone book. Over here is somebody's impromptu target that they were generous enough to leave for the rest of us. We're in an area where a lot of people like to come out here and target shoot. The reason they come here is because there was another area like this about three miles back that you can't go anymore because due to all the litter it got closed. I'm pretty sure this area will get closed soon enough. The thing with all this litter is it goes back to when I was in hunter education class when I was just a little kid. One of the test questions was the biggest reason for anti-hunter sentiment is and the answer you're supposed to check is hunter misconduct. This is misconduct. Now, these people were not hunters, they're just chowderheads with guns, but still we all get lumped together. This is the kind of thing that gets your hunting and shooting areas closed. Everybody, please, pick up after yourselves. Okay, that having been said, let's get to today's topic. I'm going to tell the long version of a story that I usually tell the short version of, and that is the time I was camping with two friends of mine, Bob and Joe, and some assailants fired at us. Now this comes with all the normal disclaimers, but I have to add a couple of them. First being that we are not in the area where it happened. We're not even in the same state where it happened. But the terrain here is close enough that it makes the point. Secondly, this story, the reason I tell the short version is because the long version is really boring and anticlimactic. But so many people wanted to hear it, here we are. And the third is, sometimes you'll hear me say I've been in a couple of citizen-involved shootings. I have. This is not one of them. Okay, that having been said, what happened was we were out rabbit hunting. And we'd made a long loop around the area, and now we were coming back to where the pickup was. And so we get back to the pickup, and we're reloading magazines, refilling canteens, and basically I was just sitting next to the pickup in a lawn chair. Well, at that point, I look way out here about 800 meters away, and I can see a pickup going down the one-lane dirt road that goes through the sagebrush. And I can see that there's people in the back, and at least a couple of them have long guns. Now, they're far enough away, I can't tell if it's rifles or shotguns or what, and there's four to six people there. It was far enough away that I couldn't really tell. Okay, well, they go behind a little bit of a hill, and I know where the road comes out, and so in about one minute, they'll come out, and I can see the vehicle. Well, a minute goes by, and they didn't come out. They stopped over there. Not a cause for alarm. This is where lots of people go target shooting and hunting and so forth. So I'm sitting there in the lawn chair, and a couple of bullets fly past. Now, when you're in the Marine Corps and you shoot for qualification, being down in the butts and having bullets flying over your head is part of the process. So I'm familiar with the sound. And as the bullets flew over, I had a Tweety Bird moment where I thought, that sounded like a, that was, that was a bullet going over my head. And I grabbed my rifle and ran around behind the only cover I had, the pickup. Well, as I'm running behind the pickup, as soon as I get behind it, I see coming from the front of the pickup is Bob. And as he comes running right toward me, it's interesting the things you notice in a situation like this. First thing I noticed is he didn't have his gun with him. Well, he'd been out doing something and left his gun unattended, and he figured getting behind cover was more important than going and grabbing it. Okay, well, a couple of more bullets go by us, and a few seconds go by, and I become aware that Joe is still standing out there, and I can hear him dinking around with some of his gear. He's oblivious to what's going on. And so I say to him, Hey, Joe, you better get down. We're taking fire. Now, those are my exact words and exactly how I said it. I can't repeat his reply to me, but basically it was he told me he didn't believe me. It's interesting the things you remember. I didn't say anything to him, but I remember so clearly just shrugging and thinking, okay. Well, I'm down here behind the pickup, and I'm looking, can't see anything, and I'm looking around the back, the tailgate, can't see anything. I never saw any person, never saw any smoke, not that you would, never saw a glint of sunlight off a rifle barrel. But these bullets are going past us. Now, it's difficult to judge such things, but based on the sound, it seemed like they were about 10 or 15 feet over our heads. And I heard a couple of bullets hit the ground and ricochet, but again, it didn't sound like they were all that close, maybe 10, 20, 30 feet away. It's really hard to tell. And they fired a total of about 15 or 20 shots. 
Well, while Bob and I are back here, and these bullets are flying by, about two, three, four shots after I talked to Joe, he comes running around the front of the pickup, and it looked like this. Okay, maybe that's not exactly what it looked like, but he came around the front of the pickup with his eyes as wide as saucers, and the first thing I noticed was he didn't bring his rifle with him. So here's the three of us behind the only cover we have, the pickup. While there's about a half dozen people out there, most, if not all of them, are armed. At least one of them is shooting at us, and the only one of us that has a firearm is me. And I've got a Ruger 1022 similar to this one, and I've got a 25 shot magazine in it, but that was the only 25 shot mag I owned at the time. The only other magazine I had was the original 10 shot in my pouch. And I had my Steyr GB 9mm with an 18 shot magazine in it and one extra mag in my pouch. I felt a little undergunned. Well, while we're there behind the pickup, four, five, six more rounds go over, and then the shooting stops. Then, between one and two minutes later, we see them drive away the same direction they'd driven in as if everything was fine. And that's what happened. Now, there's a bunch of questions that come up. And before I get to those, one other thing. When it comes to litter bugs, shotgun shooters are the worst. Okay, the questions that come up is, first of all, this sounds like a hunting accident. Why am I so sure that they were shooting at us intentionally. Okay, we were about 10 miles away from the closest crossroads that you could even begin to call a town. The idea that about a half dozen people load up all their guns, drive out in the middle of nowhere, shoot 20 rounds, and then go home, that doesn't even make sense. Also, they had 360 degrees they could have shot, but they chose to shoot the one degree that's directly at us. That doesn't seem likely that it's an accident. And then we saw them driving in. They had to have seen us. We were in the wide open, sitting next to a full-size F-150. And the pickup we had was not dark blue like this one. It was fire engine red. They saw us. They were shooting at us intentionally. I have no idea why. Well, that brings up the question, if they were shooting at us intentionally, why didn't they hit us? Well, based on the sound I could hear, I'm pretty sure they were shooting a 22 long rifle from a distance of more or less 300 meters. Now a 22 will go that far and it's deadly at that distance, but there's a lot of drop. When you shoot at that distance, you need to elevate quite a bit. The thing is, a lot of amateurs really overestimate the drop. And so when they need to elevate about like this, they end up elevating about like this. And that's why the bullets went about 10 feet over our heads. At least that's the nearest I can figure. Now, the next question, of course, is, did I shoot back? No. Why? Because although, given a couple of minutes to think about it, it became obvious they were shooting at us intentionally, while it was happening, I couldn't be certain of that. Now, to shoot back and have any legitimacy as a self-defense shooting requires, at least in the state that this occurred in, that you reasonably believe you're in imminent danger of death or serious bodily harm. Well, I certainly believed that as bullets were whizzing right over my head, but there was zero physical evidence to back that up. The bullets and shell casings wouldn't matter because the entire place is littered with those. And so to shoot back, I might have hit one of them, and I wouldn't have had any physical evidence to back up a self-defense case. And yes, you really do have to think about things like that while you're being shot at. Now the final question that comes up all the time is, well, did we call the police? And the answer is no. In that area, there was no cell signal. Not only that, call the police and tell them what? That people that were so far away that I couldn't even tell you what gender they were shot at us and there's zero physical evidence to back it up? There was nothing to tell the police. Not only that, and I hope no one takes offense to this, but I've seen it happen. At that time, we were the big city out of towners in this little rural area, and when you're in that position and you have a problem with the locals and then you have to deal with local law enforcement, the out-of-towners usually get the short end of that stick. So that's pretty much the entirety of the time we were rabbit hunting and got shot at. And I like to tell the short version of this because it really illustrates points like situational awareness and a couple of others. And you can see my reluctance to tell the long version because it's really just not very interesting. But for those who ask to see it, there it is. And Thanks for watching. <laughs>